Oxford University Museum of Natural History is home to an internationally significant natural history collection, including the first dinosaur fossils to be scientifically described, and the only surviving soft tissue from a dodo anywhere in the world. But it's also one of the most remarkable buildings of the Gothic Revival, a treasure house of Victorian sculpture and design. My name is John Holmes. I'm Professor of Victorian Literature and Culture at the University of Birmingham, and an Honorary Associate of the Museum. Over this series of podcasts, I want to introduce you to the art and architecture of Oxford University Museum of Natural History, and to give you a virtual tour of this extraordinary and beautiful building. In the last episode, I described how the museum came to be built, through a unique collaboration between scientists, architects and pre-Raphaelite artists. In this second episode, I want to begin to show you the museum itself, looking at how the sculpture on its facade encapsulated the messages Oxford University wanted to teach its Victorian students about natural history and natural theology. The overall design for Oxford University Museum was drawn up by the Irish architect Benjamin Woodward, but many other people were involved in creating the details of its decorative schema. It was the diocesan architect for Oxford, George Edmund Street, who first proposed that the museum should be built in a Gothic style for two main reasons. Firstly, Gothic architecture had always been decorated with carvings of plants and animals, so this was a fitting style for a museum which wanted to teach natural history, not just through its collections, but through art. Secondly, while classical architecture went back to pagan Greece and Rome, Gothic had always been a Christian style associated with cathedrals, churches and abbeys. Both these principles of Gothic architecture can be seen at work in the decorative sculpture on the museum's facade. According to Henry Ackland, the Regis Professor of Medicine at Oxford who led the campaign to build the museum, the carvings on the windows across the facade were supposed to illustrate some part of the fauna and flora of our planet. The first floor windows on the south side of the tower were supposedly going to be carved to represent different orders of mammals, starting with humans, then other primates, then carnivores, while those on the north side are carved mainly with birds. But whatever the university and its scientists had in mind, they had to contend with something they had hoped for, but not necessarily bargained for. They were working with artists of genius. The carvings around the windows of the museum are largely the work of two men. John Ruskin was Victorian England's most famous art critic, the friend and patron of the Pre-Raphaelites, and an influential teacher and social reformer. An old college friend of Ackland, he'd been involved in the design of the museum from the outset. In 1855, Ruskin drew a portfolio of designs for windows, going on to pledge £300 of his own money, a very substantial sum at the time and one of the largest single donations to the museum, to pay for them to be carved. James O'Shea was a working-class Irish stonemason, whose exact origins remain obscure to this day. Along with his brother John and his nephew Edward Whelan, he came over with Woodward from Dublin, where they'd been working together on a new museum building for Trinity College. It was fundamental to Ruskin's Gothic credo that, as he explained in a letter to Ackland, all architectural ornamentation should be executed by the men who design it. This was exactly how O'Shea preferred to work. So it is ironic that when his carving upset the university, it was Ruskin's designs that he ended up executing instead. The story goes something like this. Towards the end of 1859, O'Shea was carving an upper window with figures of monkeys. The master of University College, Frederick Plumptree, accused him of damaging university property, so O'Shea cheekily recarved the monkeys into cats, scotching Ackland's scientific schema. Ackland told this story as a joke some 35 years later to explain why the carvings round the so-called cat window look more like medieval grotesques than natural history illustrations, so it may not even be true, but it does seem that the university authorities were unhappy with O'Shea's style of carving, as for his next task they required him to repress the seemingly irrepressible and to carve the window immediately below the cat window to a design drawn by Ruskin four years before. Where the cat window is charmingly exuberant and playful, the Ruskin window, as it's known, is elegant and meticulous in its truth to nature. Ruskin's design centres on two strawberry plants, growing across one another from the tops of the window's two central columns. O'Shea's carving follows Ruskin's finished drawing to the letter. After this, their collaboration became more equal, and more in line with Ruskin's own principles. O'Shea moved back up to the first floor, 
and began to carve the window to the left of the central tower. The theme of this window is birds, and O'Shea's carving incorporates several features sketched out by Ruskin in his early designs. These include the columns of birds up the sides of the window, the bands of oak leaves growing round the main arch, and the two birds who face each other just below it. The bird at the centre of the tracery has stepped straight out of one of Ruskin's most appealing designs, raising its head to fit the shape of its new home. If the cat window shows O'Shea at his most creative, and the Ruskin window shows Ruskin's care and refinement as a designer, this third window combines the vitality of O'Shea's sculpture with Ruskin's eye for architectural detail, beginning a series of beautiful celebrations of bird life across this wing of the building. If the carvings round the windows of Oxford University Museum of Natural History celebrate the natural world, those round its main entrance tell you how Oxford's Victorian scientists wanted its visitors to interpret it. In Oxford, in the 1850s when the museum was built, the main aim of natural history was to reveal the marvels of God's creation. By understanding nature, we could understand the mind of God. As a designer, but also, in Ackland's words, as the ever-living, ever-working artist. Natural history was natural theology, and the museum was to encapsulate what another of its founders, Richard Greswell, called God's own museum, the physical universe. As you entered it, you were to be in no doubt that this was a Christian building. The first artist who was asked to design the carvings above the arch was Thomas Woolner, the one member of the original Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood who was a sculptor by trade. Woolner drew a design illustrating the fall of man reminiscent of Michelangelo's depiction of the same scene on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome. Given that, according to the story, Adam and Eve were expelled from Eden for eating the fruit of the Tree of Knowledge, this would have been, frankly, an odd emblem for a museum promoting knowledge of the natural world. The contract for the design passed to another artist with Pre-Raphaelite connections, John Hungerford Pollen, who chose to focus not on the fall, but on redemption. Pollen's design still illustrates the biblical story, with the different days of creation up the sides of the arch, and Jesus and an angel above it. But the tree of knowledge has been replaced by the tree of life. Eve is present, but Adam oddly absent, though he is reinstated in the final carving. Pollen's design was only partly carved before the funding for the art at the museum ran out. The days of creation were left off, which gave Ackland the freedom many years later to reinterpret the beautiful geometrical arrangement of plants growing up the arch itself as a symbol of evolution. The most striking change to the symbolism, though, is in the carving of an angel above the arch. In Pollen's design, he holds two books, the Bible, or the Book of God, and the Book of Nature, itself implicitly written in God's hand. In the carving, the Book of Nature has been replaced by a disc showing dividing cells. Cell theory was absolutely cutting-edge science when the museum was built, bringing together botany, zoology and medicine as well as the technology of the microscopes which had first enabled scientists to see cells barely twenty years before. It is a remarkably fitting image for the museum's purpose, teaching modern science at the heart of a Christian university. In the next episode we will cross the threshold to see how Oxford's Victorian scientists, working with Woodward, the O'Shea's and the Pre-Raphaelites, used art to turn the museum's interior into an object lesson in science.